So bow your heads with me this morning as we go before the Lord, asking him to make clear the message, Jesus the Sabbath and the Jews. Loving Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to be able to open your word, to look into its pages and recognize that our contribution is like the dot at the end of a sentence. And yet it exudes holiness and it exudes the mind of a, an infinite God that we cannot even embrace. So take the Lord, I pray today, your servant. Use me as a vessel that will bring honor just to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to begin with a scripture reading found in Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. A very pivotal scripture that lays foundation for what's coming afterwards. The words of Jesus, and I will give you the framework of this, these two passages. There's a story behind it that oftentimes we incarcerate the scripture into just a couple of verses, but it has a beautiful story leading up to it, letting us know why Jesus said what he did. Well, let's begin here. And he, that is Jesus, said to them, Mark 2, verse 27 and 28, the Sabbath was made for, say it with me, man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Deception never solidifies overnight. It takes years, decades, and in some cases millennia for a lie to turn into concrete. Deception never solidifies overnight. It has taken Satan nearly 6,000 years to build a resume of lies against the validity and the immutability of God's Sabbath. I addressed some of these in prior sermons. I addressed many of the popular theories created to ignore the Sabbath. I did a sermon called The Change of the Sabbath in which I addressed issues such as when people say the Sabbath was ended at crucifixion, that is addressed in my sermon. There's the date I preached it. You can go to my webpage, johnlomaking.com, or come right here to tvsdac.org, and you can find that sermon, The Change of the Sabbath. I addressed in that very same sermon the idea that the Sabbath was only for the Jews. It's in that sermon. So this topic is so broad and so, so encompassing that you can't just preach one sermon and cover it all. It's like trying to preach a sermon about love. It's a never-ending attempt. Also, in covering this, I covered the Sunday controversy. In this sermon, I address all of the texts in the New Testament that deal with the first day of the week, seeing if we could find in any one of these 12 verses any authority for the change of the Sabbath. Very informative, very scriptural, the Sunday controversy. Why the Sunday controversy? Because in the solidifying of the concrete of lies that Satan has formed over the course of nearly 6,000 years, he has been intensely creative in coming up with things that even on your best and wisest day, you may say, where did that come from? And so I address, where did that come from? That Sunday is the new day of worship in the sermon, the Sunday controversy. Then in the sermon entitled, Protestants Speak, I address what Protestant leaders say in support of the Sabbath, verifying that the Sabbath was not scripturally changed, but how the change was made. This sermon covers what Protestants say, what Baptists say, what Pentecostals say, what Presbyterians say, what Methodists say, about where the Sabbath change come from. What is ironic to me is in these sermons, I'm reading these quotations from well-known leaders of these denominations 
and they know the Sabbath hasn't been changed, but they leave their congregants to observe a day that they know the Sabbath has not been changed to. They say the Sabbath hasn't been changed. So the sermon addresses that. Then this one called Sunday Mask, which shows the Protestants' push around the world, documented to make Sunday the high point of the week. It's in print. It's in advertising. It's in the yearly Make Sunday Special movement that happens every September, every year, for the last 25 or so years, make Sunday special. And I told you that when I first saw that a number of decades ago, I called them because on the list you can sign up for your church to participate in this Make Sunday Special campaign. And I went to their website and I was able to hit the, down, uh, the um, drop down menu and I saw their Adventist, A, to have a campaign to make Sunday special. <laughs> Then I said, wait a minute. So I scrolled all the way down to S, and I saw Seventh-day Adventist. And I thought, wait a minute. Would an Adventist or a Seventh-day Adventist church have a campaign to make Sunday special? Absolutely not. So I called. I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I noticed on your website, in the list of churches where you are encouraging campaigns to be held to make Sunday special, that Adventist and Seventh-day Adventists were listed there. It was gone the next month. I said, we don't honor Sunday. We honor the Bible Sabbath. But I also want to say that there are upwards of about 500 different scattered denominations that also honor the Bible Sabbath. But they may be off on what happens when you die or how Jesus' second coming is going to be literal and visible. They think of it as a secret rapture. So the devil has found ways like salt and pepper. He may season this part of the teachings you believe and he will add some Bible there, but he would fail to put seasoning on this side so it becomes just a theory or an idea with no scriptural support. So today I'm going to use scriptures that are going to make the devil angry because he knows that people would rather listen to their leaders than study God's word for themselves. So let's begin at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. The capstone of a week that we are still benefiting from 6,000 years later. God's ability and amazing hand in creating everything we see, including us. Genesis 1, 31. Then God saw how many things? everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the what? Sixth day. One very important point, the day begins in the evening. When the sun sets tonight, biblically we are starting Sunday night, then Sunday. That's why when noon, when 12 o'clock comes, they call it midday. Tonight at 12 o'clock they call it mid. Night, meaning the night didn't begin there. From evening to evening, Leviticus 23, 32, from evening to evening you shall celebrate the Sabbath. If you don't know what the sunset time is, ask Google or Siri. And in all instances, most of the time they agree by maybe a minute or so. But you look at the creation. When God finished creating the world, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth days, he saw everything that he had done, and he said, indeed, it was very good. So you see, when you put it together, God's physical creation took how many days? Six days. This is really significant. This is like the beginning of the movie. You miss this, you miss the rest of it. God's physical creation took how many days? Six days. So let's follow this. So, so the question is then, why do we have a seven-day week? God's physical creation took place on the first six days. The answer to the question, why do we have a seven-day week, is this. God's spiritual creation took how many days? One day. 
So let's go ahead and make something really, really clear. And I've done this before. I tried this on an atheist. I asked an atheist, I said, you know, when you, when you study the Bible, one of the things you should learn is how to ask leading questions, meaning there's only one answer. Like, for example, what, what is, what's today? What day is today? What is the name of today? Saturday. Saturday. Okay. Only one answer. So I asked him, I said, how many days are there in a week? He said, seven. I said, can you find anywhere in creation any kind of astronomical confirmation that there's a seven-day week? And he thought about it. I said, can you find it in the rising and the setting of the sun? No. How long does that take? About 24 hours. Can you find it in the cadence of the seasons? Some, summer, fall, winter, spring? No. That's simply the cadence of the year. Can you find it in the 12 months of the year, from January to December? No. Can you find it in the cycles of the moon, from a quarter to a half to three quarters, so on and so forth, full, back, down, the other way, eight cycles of the moon within a period of 30 days? No. I said to him, where is the only place you can find a seven-day week? He didn't have the answer. I said, let me answer that for you, in the Bible. I had this conversation with, uh, I'll give you the backstory. It's rare. We had two young folk that were doing missionary work in, in Africa. And they met this young man in Africa, and he was a part of a program we did here at 3ABN. I was interviewing him. So I surely thought he was a Christian only to find out afterwards he was an atheist. And I said, how did, you get on our, how did you get on our set? He said, well, I'm here in a different capacity. I'm here to just talk about the missionary project. And I really like the work your church does, so I was supportive of working with them in their missionary work in Africa. <laughs> Curtis looked shocked. <laughs> Give him some oxygen, Dara, Dara. But I met him again at ASI because he was also there. And I sat down and had lunch with him for two days and it's very interesting. So I said, let me spend some time with you. And those were the questions I asked him, among others, the next day. And at the end of our two days, maybe about an hour or so each day, he came to me and he said, I just want to thank you for the time you spent with me for the first time in my adult life. I think you've given me pause to think that there is a God. Amen. He said, that weak thing, really, that, that caught me. Because there's no, no uh, there, uh, he said, there is a seven-day week, but there's no place that's found other than in the Bible. And I believe in a seven-day week. And I said to him, so why don't you believe in God? So you see, right off the bat, the Sabbath was created in a perfect environment. What kind of environment? Perfect environment. It was the capstone, the capstone of God's ability to create. So watch this. We're going to go through this in detail. We're going to really undress this topic. If the Sabbath is done away and deleted and no longer relevant, then we have just reduced our workload to just six-day weeks. So like we do at 3ABN, you work four days, you get one day off, you're back to work. <laughs> Don't get two days off. If you believe the Sabbath is done away with, you only get... One day off, and you're back to work the day after that. There is no other reason, there is no other functioning purpose for the last day of the week other than what the Bible says. Let the Bible speak for itself. Could you try again? Sorry, Siri, I did that very well. It's funny, Siri said, I didn't get that. Could you try again? I'll repeat myself in a moment. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Here is the record. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were, what's the next word? Finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from how much of his work? All his work, which he had done. Verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God created and made. First question, 
that naturally follows. Was God tired? Absolutely not. God doesn't do things arbitrarily. He does it to leave a number of examples for us. As Jesus said, I washed your feet, so you ought to wash one another's feet. He who abides in him ought himself also to walk as Jesus walked. He was the, he was the consummate example setter. And then he says, all these things were written for our admonition and our examples unto whom the ends of the ages have come. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You find that mentioned twice. Examples. Jesus didn't get baptized because he was a sinner. He got baptized to kill the sin nature that he took on. But he also left an example that we should do as he has done. So when God rested, he says, I'm saving, I'm saving this example, and this example is so important that, that I'm allotting one whole day. Every time this day comes, you remember I created Everything you see, I rested, therefore you rest from all your labors as I rested from mine. When you do that, one thing we must keep in mind, it is the only day that God rested on, God blessed, God sanctified. The Sabbath is not a Jewish institution. It is an institution of Almighty God. There were no Jews around God did not give any Jew the responsibility of saying, this is our day. Now, let me ask a question. Were the trees of fruit just for the Jews? Is marriage just for Jews? Do only Jews sin? Do only Jews die? Is it only murder because a Jew does it? Absolutely not. God created everything he did for humanity. The Sabbath is a perfect reminder of the creative ability of our God. He creates, he is the creator. And don't forget, this is and occurred at the time when there was a controversy brewing during creation. You may remember that if you're at Venice and you know the stories. During the creation process, there was another controversy going on, and there was war in heaven. Lucifer wanted to be in the councils of God. He was shut out from that. And thus, this war that was taking place during creation resulted in his expulsion from heaven and being evicted to this earth. Thus, the temptation in the Garden of Eden. So when God capstone his creation, putting his stamp of divine approval on the seventh day, the devil had in his mind, I will be like the Most High. I promise you. Everything that you establish for your recognition, I will attack vehemently. And the Sabbath has not been untouched by the arch enemy. A perfect day created in a perfect environment. God's memorial of creation. So therefore, as long as we have a seven-day week, the Sabbath is perpetual. You can't get rid of the seven-day week. There's some countries that have tried. I remember the story. I read about this in Europe where they tried a 10-day work week, almost wore the Europeans out. They had to go back to a regular five-day work week and then get the two days off. There's a spiritual cadence God builds into the week that is the divi a divine insert that even our bodies, even as a pastor, you know when Friday comes, I'm happy when Friday comes. Now, you know, I may go to bed at 3 o'clock on Friday night or Sabbath morning, but that's good time. I go to bed at 3 o'clock, I wake up at 7 o'clock, and I'm fine, and stand up here and preach a sermon and not even yawn once, so you better not yawn. But here's my point. The Sabbath brings with it untold blessings because God designed it to be so. But the question that comes to my mind is how could something so perfect be so hated? Just do the test. Talk to a pastor of a different, of a different denomination or a Christian of a different faith. 
mention the Sabbath, and you'll instantly begin to see the wheels turning. I'm serious. It's like when God made the Sabbath, it was the worst thing he ever decided to do. That's the way that people get it. They think that the Sabbath was the worst thing that God ever did. You mentioned the Sabbath. Folk get upset. The excuses start flying. But let me walk you through some reasoning that's very deep here, and I'll just, I just hope it's deep enough for you. There are only two institutions that God blessed during creation week. And both are the object of Satan's hatred. God blessed the Sabbath, and God blessed the what? The marriage. The same reasoning is used for ignoring the Bible Sabbath and Bible marriage. And I must put this pin in it. How dare somebody accuse me, which I've been accused of, supporting the infiltration of homosexuality in our churches. I get accused of all kinds of stuff. I just want to make the record clear. I believe in a man marrying a woman Amen. and a woman marrying a man. Amen. And whether it's a law of the land or not, God is the final authority. But let's look at these two distortions. Instead of keeping God's seventh-day Sabbath, countless Christians say, as long as we love the Lord, that's all that matters. Have you heard that before? So they, you know what they do? They pick the day they prefer. But watch how diabolical that is. Now, marriage distortion. Instead of honoring biblical marriage, man to woman, woman to man, men marry men, and women marry women, and they say the same thing. As long as we love each other, that's all that matters. And then they pick the gender they prefer. Now look at the devil. He's got one picking the day they prefer, another one picking the gender they prefer. Using the same strategy, Satan leads Christians to pick the day they prefer. He leads worldlings to pick the gender they prefer. The same act is used to justify Sunday worship as it is used to justify same-sex marriage. And what is the argument? People pick what they prefer, not what God commands. And they cover it with smiles. I'm getting sick of that as I get older. So many people that I know personally, intimately, speak to them, talk to them. And with a smile, they say, well, you know, I, I know what the Bible says about the Sabbath, but I love the Lord. I mean, I, 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 mean, I do all this, I do all that. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, he that turneth his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. When you know and you do not do, God doesn't say you get a pass from obedience. And people smile and they put another coin in the, the in, into the machine of disobedience to keep their disobedience going and they say, I just, I love the Lord. That's all that matters. That should be sufficient for same-sex marriage. I love him. I love her. That's all that matters. Man love man, woman love woman. That does not fly in God's sight, and neither does the abrogation and the purposeful ignorance of a Sabbath. But let me put a pin in this. There are some people that take a while for that to sink in, and when they finally get it, they open their eyes, and they say, yes, Lord, you were right all along. And it's not my job to determine who's who. But sometimes it, gets, it kind of gets to sandpaper. When people prefer the way of death over God's way of life, and they try to justify it by saying, all that matters is I love the Lord. That's not all that matters. If you love me, keep my commandments. Good Adventists know that text. John 14, if you love me, there is something that love requires, not a mental assent or a verbal assent, but an action in your life. That's why today the spiritual fog that hovers over Christianity exists, because the word of man is preferred above the word of God. The Sabbath is not embraced as a blessing, but resisted as God's worst decision. Who could be behind that other than the enemy? That when you mention the Sabbath, people get uncomfortable. There they go again, the Sabbath. 
Somebody asked me once, why do you guys talk about the Sabbath so much? Isaiah 58, verse 12. They that shall be of thee shall build up the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations. They shall be called repairers of the breach, restorers of paths to dwell. And it is my responsibility as a preacher of the gospel to tell you that your foundation is about to crumble. Repair the breach, restore the path, raise up the foundations of many generations, restore the paths to dwell in. And then in the very next verses, which I'll use later in my sermon, verses 13 and 14, what is God talking about restoring and repairing and, and rebuilding? The Sabbath. So we have a whole Christian world, millions of Christians all over the world, singing beautiful songs. They wrap their disobedience in lovely music. God have mercy. But that's not new because Nebuchadnezzar wrapped his disobedience in lovely music on the plain of Dura. The evidence of Babylonian worship. I know what you say, Lord, but I'd rather bow down when the music is played at another altar. So what happens is those who believe that, they believe that the Sabbath did not, did not exist until Sinai. That's not scriptural. Then they believe that the Sabbath is separate from the commandments, the Ten Commandments. That's not scriptural. The Ten Commandments and the Sabbath are in effect side by side together. Amen. Look at Genesis 26 and verse 5. God promised to bless all the nations of the earth through a man who was not Jewish, born in Chaldea, a province of Babylon. His obedience as a non-Jew is striking to the fact that the Bible says about him what it does. Look at Genesis 26, verses 4 and 5. This wonderful promise. Oh, by the way, I needed to bring this up before I go to that. Forgot about it. And I did this intentionally to show you that we have a seven-day week. All the things that God created each of the days, creation of the day and the night, creation of the firmament, the heavens, creation of the vegetation, the fruit trees, creation of the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day, creation of the birds and the sea creatures, on the sixth day, creation of animals and humanity. And on the seventh day, the only red one, that's the only day that God created something spiritual. Thus, we have a seven-day week. Praise God for a seven-day week. But in the context of that, God made it very clear. I'm not going to change that. There's nothing. By the way, all of this was done before sin entered the world. Why would you have to get rid of something that was perfect in a perfect environment before sin entered the world? It just doesn't, there's no logic. You ask that question, give me a reason why you got to get rid of the Sabbath and you can't find any that are legitimate. But you'll find a whole lot, but none legitimate. Let's look at Genesis 26 and verse 4 and 5. The promise that God extended to the generation that will come through Abraham. Verse 4 of Genesis 26, I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. How many nations? All. Regardless of your nationality, your origin, all the nations. Not exclusive, but inclusive. And it says in verse 5, the reason, because... Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. There were no Jews on the menu. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob prevails. His name becomes Israel. He has 12 sons. Jacob's name is changed from Jacob to Israel. Israel is a spiritual term. That's why Romans 9 verse 6 says, they that are of Israel are not all Israel. The belief in the mind of the Jew is that you have, you have a right because you're born nationally. We only have a right because we are born again spiritually. Where you're born does not automatically convey you to heaven. You could be born on the front row in the church. You've got to be born again. There's no, special, there's no speciality there. And when you read this, you find also that God does not say, I'll bless you if you keep some of my commandments. Blessing 
that God extends to us, the blessings always come in obedience to not some. Let the Scripture speak for itself. Look at Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. It's a heart issue. It's a what kind of issue? It's a heart issue. Deuteronomy 5, 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me, that is reverence God, and always keep how many? All my commandments. Let me say this to us. It's not just the Sabbath. All the commandments matter. That it might be well with them and with their children for how long? Forever. We talked about this in Sabbath school this morning. The Jews believed that so indelibly that they bound their hands with leather straps. They bound the commandments to their hands. They, they had a box on the front of their forehead, and they put the commandments in a box as frontlets between their eyes. They bound it there. But what God was in essence saying is, with your works and with your beliefs, you support obedience to my commandments. But if there was a little, literal thing, so they have a box on their doorposts of their houses. They touch the commandments as they go in. Some touch it on the way out. They teach it to their children. God is not looking for this change to happen in brick and stone. He's looking for the change to happen in the heart of humanity. Now, there are those that think that the Sabbath was not brought into existence until Sinai. That's once again not scriptural. When the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt and God sent Moses to be the ambassador of freedom, Moses did something that most of us miss. You see, we, we know Exodus 16, but there's another passage in the Bible other than Exodus chapter 16 where the Sabbath is reiterated, and we often miss that. Look at Exodus chapter 5 and verse 5. This you may have seen in the movie with Charlton Heston where, they got, where Pharaoh got upset. It's not all scripturally accurate. But notice this. And Pharaoh said, speaking to Moses, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labors? That word there in the Hebrew is Shabbat. You give them Sabbath rest from their labors before they even left Egypt, before they got to Sinai. The Sabbath was restored among the slaved captives that were in Egypt. That's why Pharaoh got so upset. You gave them rest. That's a passage that's hidden in the Scriptures. They go, they go to Exodus 20, but they don't look at Exodus 16, and they definitely don't look at Exodus chapter 5. It's in the Scriptures. And I reiterate, as long as it's wrong to murder, to lie, to commit adultery, to steal, to misrepresent God, to take his name in vain. As long as all those things are wrong, the validity of the Sabbath will abide with them. They are not ten suggestions. You don't put them together like a Rubik's Cube. They are one package. It's called in the Hebrew the ten words, not the nine words and the one suggestion. I was reading an article from, a, from one of the very common websites where you know, all kinds of churches put all kinds of stuff on the Internet. And by the way, because it's on the Internet, don't believe that it's always right. Check it out by God's Word. But they said the reason why we don't keep the Sabbath is because, well, the Sabbath is no longer relevant. You know, it's just an, it's an invitation. It's an invitation. It's not a command. So they said there are nine commandments and one invitation. And I wanted to read my Bible and say, I never saw, and God wrote these nine, invita nine commandments and one invitation on two tables of stone. It's Ten Commandments. And it's the only one that has the word remember. It's just like the devil. For God to say remember and the devil say forget. So let's look at the exercise very quickly. You will not get a pastor on this planet to disagree with with. Uh, the wise man Solomon, when he says, remember now the creator in the days of thy youth. There's not a pastor that would disagree that young people don't need to know Jesus. Am I right? What pastor in what church would you say, would say, no, young folk don't need to know Jesus. There would not be a clergy on the planet that will agree with the fact that young people don't need to know Jesus. Then we go to Luke, that very short verse. Remember Lot's wife. Once again, there's not a clergy that will disagree with that. What's the lesson in Lot's wife when God says go forward? Don't look. Don't look back. Nobody would disagree. Solomon said one. Dr. Luke said the other. Now watch this. 
They'll all agree. But God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And they say, ah, 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 nah, 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 nah. That is not what I am going to do. They don't even consider the source. God said it, but I'm not doing I will do what Solomon said. I'll do what Dr. Luke says. That's why I tell you today, there is a different spirit operating in the lives of those who respond to the Sabbath that way. There's a different spirit responding in the lives of those. There's a different spirit active when the commandments of God when his Sabbath is something you don't even want to consider observing. And he says, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. The question is, no, that's not my God, so I'm going to pick a day that best identifies the God I want to worship. Just like the man I want to marry, a man marrying a man or a woman marrying a woman. I'm going to pick the gender I prefer. I'll pick the day I prefer. There's a different spirit. And I'm getting to the place where I can't continue to work Excuse that. It's God's word. I know what the Bible says, but no, no, it's not there. The Sabbath was reminded, the Jews were reminded of the Sabbath. They went in as Hebrews, they came out as Israelites. And in their journey to Sinai, another example of the Sabbath perpetuity is given in Scripture. Look at Exodus chapter 16. The Lord told them, I'm going to give you food every day. There'll be a certain amount, but when the Sabbath comes, when Friday evening comes, get a double portion so that when Sabbath comes, you won't go out looking for any manner. And manner, somebody says, what is it? It's manner. What is it? It's manner. What is it? It's manner. Now, I want you to get this. Don't fall asleep on me now because we'll let you go home and sleep after this. I went to bed at three, not you. Watch this. Don't miss it. Before they got to Sinai, God tested them. And I want you to notice the phraseology is based on a time. Is based on a time. When they went out on the Sabbath looking for manna and there was none, look what the Bible says, Exodus 16, verse 28. Look what it says. And the Lord said to Moses, How long? What's those two words? How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? What does that say? How long? So if I just told you, if I didn't tell you to do something yet, I can't ask you how long. If you didn't know about it, I can ask you how long. But if you've known about it and you persistently refuse to honor it, then and only then can I ask you, how long do you, what's the next word? Refuse to keep my commandments and my laws. Verse 29, see, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives what? He gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. Same thing applies today. If you live locally, if you live in the community here, you shouldn't be going to a restaurant on the Sabbath. You live right around the neighborhood. Go home. Let, be, let by your example be seen that you honor the Sabbath and you're not needlessly putting your neighbor, your, your manservant or your maidservant to labor when God has given you a day to prepare for the Sabbath. Sabbath preparation is necessary. If you haven't made food, go home and have a sandwich. But don't by your example in the community cause somebody else to violate the very Sabbath. You are to be an example People go bowling on the Sabbath. Adventists. I just heard recently some church members went bowling on the Sabbath. Bowling on the Sabbath. And they say, we keep the Sabbath. No, you keep yourself from keeping the Sabbath. Now, I know you can put a list together of all the things you should and should not do, but it should be very simple. Whatever does not glorify God and uplift Jesus should not be participated in. Now, you might say, well, what about the newspaper? You, could, you, you, need, to, you need some bad news on the Sabbath? Do you really? You need bad news on the Sabbath? Do you need to read your bill? You need to know how much money you owe on the Sabbath? Put your mail aside. Wait till the sunset. 
You need to, you need to get that collection notice on the Sabbath. The car going to be repossessed. You need to let that mess up your Sabbath. No, put all that stuff. When God says, it's like when you go out to dinner with your wife or your husband on your anniversary, are you going to take a stack of mail to the restaurant with you? Huh? No. I bet you your wife or your husband said, what is that? It's our mail, honey. We're going to go through our mail at this special dinner. <laughs> Ladies, come on, say. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So where are we going today? Honey, I got a date with the guys. I know it's our anniversary, but we got this tournament today. I got a date with the guys. Let's celebrate our anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> now, honey, did you say I do to me or to them? <laughs> Amen, ladies. Amen. See, if you're particular, God is particular. Right? And he's no respecter of person. There's not a person on the planet that you could say to God, I know what you said, but I need today to go boating. God said, on my water, under my sky, I'm going to dry up that lake. No, don't, don't, don't take God lightly. So let's look at what God says. When they went out, God said to them, how long? Meaning, you should know better. And then when they got to Sinai and God reiterated, reiterated by writing it on stones, why would God write the commandment on stones to show its perpetuity, its immutability, its longevity, its inability for you to rescribe re it? He didn't write it on parchment that you can erase it and put your own. He, he, I don't know how he did that, but I want to tell you, when he was done, it was perfect. Let's look at the Sabbath command for a moment, and then we're going to take off. The Sabbath is based on God's creation, not the Jews. Let's look at it. Let's say it together. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Why? Look at the connection right back to the last day of the week, right back to the last day of creation. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the what? Seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and did what? hallowed it. He connects this at Sinai. Here, folk that were there were not at Sinai. God said to these Israelites, I'm going to make you my, you are going to be my Federal Express. You're going to be my UPS. You're going to take the mail, the message all over the world. I need you to understand what you need to communicate with the other nations. When they failed to communicate it to the other nations, as Acts chapter 13 says, it was necessary that the, the light of God be given to you first and that you be a light unto the Gentiles. But seeing you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Paul said, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For God has, God has ordained you to be a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. God did not call the Jews to observe what other per people didn't have to observe. God didn't say, these commandments, you, could, you can't do this, but everybody else could do this except you. No, they were to be the depositors of truth to communicate what was clear for all of humanity because every one of us is blessed by the creation of God. Every one of us. And then people say, well, you know, the reason why we don't keep the Sabbath is because it's a part of the 640 laws. No, let the Bible speak. Look at Deuteronomy 5 and verse 22. This is the reiteration of the commandments in, Acts chapter, in Exodus chapter 20. This is reiterated to the children that grew up now to be adults. They were young when they came out of Egypt. They did not understand. Now, under the leadership of Joshua, this is reiterated again, reiterated again. Notice the words of God. And he makes it clear that there are only ten. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the, midst, in the mountain from the midst of the fire the cloud, and the thick darkness with a what kind of voice? 
loud voice, and say it together. He added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. Just last year, I did a sermon called God's Blessed Day. You can find it on 3ABN+. Plus. God's Blessed Day in my last evangelistic series in Pleasant Hill, California. In that sermon, I outline the difference between the ceremonial Sabbaths and the creation Sabbath, between all the feasts and the observances that were shadows of things to come, but the Sabbath was not a shadow. The, the, Sabbath, was an, the Sabbath was an affirmation, not a shadow. It was an affirmation. If sin never entered the world, the, sh the Sabbath at creation was not a shadow. It did not have any temporary nature with it. It is as eternal as the blessing of God and as God himself. Amen. So this idea that the Sabbath is being intended, that the Sabbath is being ignored today, it's not new. Satan was, Satan was successful in getting the Israelites to ignore the Sabbath as they continued in all their rounds, and we're going to talk about some of the traditions they added, so I've got to move a little faster. As they got involved in all the rounds of their observances, they got more linked to the traditions and started ignoring the validity of the Sabbath, the valid day that God established. And in the book of Ezekiel, which my wife and I are reading together, God rebuked the leaders of Israel for even themselves knowing better Ignore the Sabbath. So it's not unusual today for people to ignore what the devil led the very ones that God gave this truth to to ignore the very same Sabbath. Look what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 26. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. That's happening among countless clergy today. They have not distinguished between the holy and unholy. They pick a day that's not holy. They ignore the one that is holy. Nor have they made a difference between the clean, unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. It is happening today. What is God saying? When you hide your eyes from the Sabbath, Let's go ahead and do that. Cover your eyes real quick. Co cover your eyes. Did I disappear? No. You just hid your eyes from me. That's all. The Sabbath is the same way. People cover their eyes. They don't want to see it. They make excuses. If I don't see it, it's not there. One person said to me, don't, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me, because if you tell me, I'll be accountable. No, you just got accountable. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Uh, don't say it. Okay, all right, sure. I was just, I was just, gonna, I was just gonna tell you that the bridge is not no longer there. That's, but if you don't want me to tell you, I won't tell you. Oh, the reasoning is 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 insane. So let's look at three quick examples, because by the time the sermon title Jesus the Sabbath and the Jews, let's look at what the Jews did to make the Sabbath in the minds of many today the way they see it. Example number one, let's go to Matthew chapter 12. At that time, in the missionary work of Christ, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were what? Hungry. Hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Who said it was not lawful, Jesus or the Pharisees? Pharisees. The Pharisees. Now watch, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay a case here. This is what happens when I talk to other pastors about the Sabbath. They always use the words of the Jews against Jesus. Didn't Jesus and his disciples violate the Sabbath? What are you saying? If he did, you're lost. Isn't that right? If Jesus sinned, we are all lost. What did Jesus respond by saying? Look at verse 3 of Matthew 12. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. What did David do? Luke brings us out. You see, he's... The Pharisees 
had made rules and regulations that were out of harmony. And they believed, before I go to Luke chapter 6, they believed, this is, this is amazing. See, if the disciples were going through the field and they picked up grain, the Pharisees would have been okay with that. But for the fact that they plucked it, they said, ah, oh, they are harvesting. And when they rolled it in their hands, they said, they're winnowing. That's unlawful on the Sabbath. Put away your John Deere and stop going through the fields on the Sabbath. <laughs> they said, if it was on the ground, they picked it up. Oh, that's okay. But once they do this, once they eat it, once they pluck it, that's harvesting, that's winnowing. Look at this. They didn't know what they were doing, but they put all these regulations. And today, people accuse Adventists of being legalists. No, we're not. That's okay. Look at Luke 6, verse 1. Now it happened on the second Sabbath, after the first, that he went through the grain field, the same story, and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. That even made the Jews even more angry. Look, they not only plucked it, harvested, but they're rubbing it in their hands. They're separating the shell from the actual grain. They are winnowing. And Jesus is saying, they're hungry. They're hungry. So watch this. So Jesus now pulls the rug out from under their misguided misapplication of the beauty of the Sabbath. And look what he does. Mark 2, verse 25 and 26. But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathah the high priest and ate the showbread which is not lawful to eat except for the priest and also gave some to those who were with him? And I told this story to my Sabbath school lesson, to my Sabbath school class very quickly. Let me make it very, David did not just neglect God's requirements and say, you know what, I don't care who this bread, I don't care who this bread is for, I'm going to get me some bread. That was not what David did. David was on a mission for the king, and when he got to a particular village, he met Elimelech, one of the priests. And Elimelech, he said to Elimelech, you know, Elimelech said, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm on a mission. Says, Shh, don't, nobody's supposed to know about this. Got some guys, do you have five loaves of bread? And Elimelech said, one of the priests, Abathar was the high priest. Elimelech said, we are out of bread. There's only one place that bread still is. It's in the temple, but it's holy bread. So look at this. First Samuel, the story. First Samuel 21, three, verse 3 and 4. Now, therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, watch this, there is no common bread on hand, no common bread, but there is what kind of bread? Holy bread. If the young men have at least kept themselves from women. Now, this is powerful. This is, this is deep. Don't pull out your hair. This is deep. David still honored there was common bread and what other kind of bread? Holy bread. To eat the holy bread, the priest said, okay, I just got to ask one question. Have any of your men been with a woman over the last three days? David said, no, no, no. We were all, we, we were all in the field. We were on our way here. And the priest said, okay, okay. Whew. Because you know, unclean folk can't eat holy things. And he gave him access to the showbread because they were hungry. David did not just rudely walk into the temple and snatch bread. I want to make it very clear. The issue here was hunger. The issue here was hunger. So this is where 
This is where this passage comes from. You wonder, I looked behind the, I looked at the backdrop. This is where this passage was born. Matthew 12, verse 9 and 10. Look at this. Matthew 12, verse 9 and 10. I want to add one verse in there before we go to that. Psalm 37, verse 25. Remember the passage. David says, I have been young and now I am old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed, what? Begging bread. Because when they needed bread, God, did you get it? That's where that came from. When they needed bread, God provided bread. He said, I've never seen God forsake the righteous. Amen, somebody. Brethren, let me make it clear. The Sabbath is the best time to alleviate the sufferings. If you've got neighbors, here's the If you've got neighbors that you know can't help themselves, help your neighbor. If you know that your, your neighbor is ill or sick and can't help themselves and they're hungry, don't say like the, like the priest on the way to the temple, well, I would stop and help you, but, I, I, but, I, but I'm on my way to church. No. Help them. But there's a difference between saying, well, I'll paint your house on the Sabbath. House ain't in pain. The house could be painted another day. You get the point? It's relieving the needs of those who are suffering. Another story here, Matthew 12, verse 9 and 10. I have one more, and then I'm going to close. Now, when he had departed from there, remember, it's the Jews, not Jesus, that has the issue with the Sabbath. He went into their village. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Look at this. This is what Christians nowadays hear. When they hear about the Sabbath, they, they use these verses to try to say, this is the reason we shouldn't keep the Sabbath. But it's the Jews' interpretation, not Jesus is. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might do what? Accuse him. Then look at verses 11 and 12. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who had, has one sheep and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Oh, how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, what? It is lawful to do what? Good on the Sabbath. Amen. If you see somebody on the side of the road, this happened to me in New York City, by the way. I was on my way to church at Bethel Seventh-day Adventist Church. And right before we, you, you don't know, it was a large street, like an intersection, kind of like Highway 13. And there was a man making the left turn, and as he was in the left turn, his car quit. And he's right in the middle of the intersection. I'm on my way to church. I didn't have a car back then. And I noticed one person ran out there and another person ran and I was about to just walk around the scene and the Lord says, help him. So I took my jacket, I folded it, put it over his car door and helped push that car out of the intersection. That's what God is talking about. You see somebody in the need, you don't say, you know, I would help you, but I'm on my way to church. That's why they said, to Je that's why even after they crucified Jesus, they said, could you take him down off the cross? We need to go to church. That's how distorted they were. Could you bring him off the cross? We need to go to church. And the thought that he's going to be on the cross is going to really mess up my Sabbath school lesson study. <laughs> Look what it says in verse 14. The Jews. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. They had a problem with the Sabbath, not Jesus. And our last example. Look at this one. Luke 14, verse 1 to 5. Now it happened as he, Jesus, went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had, what, dropsies, like some of you, sleeping in church. Lord sees you. And Jesus answered, <laughs> answering spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, his two greatest adversaries, lawyers and Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, this is Jesus throwing it out. But they said, that, but they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit? will not immediately pull him out on what? The Sabbath day. You see the difference? 
When people say Adventists are legalists, they're putting us into the category of the Pharisees. That's why we have community services. That's why we have personal ministries. That's why we have community outreach. We must care for those around us. Amen, somebody. Don't let your observance of the Sabbath be that which causes your brother or your sister to be left in hardship and you say, well, I can't help you. i got other things to do. The Pharisees disagree with Jesus' youth of the, of the Sabbath, not the, way, not the other way around. When the Lord put it to them, notice what the Bible says in verse 6 of Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 14, and they could not answer him regarding these things. They couldn't say anything to Jesus. You know why? Because he is Lord of the Sabbath. Can you say amen? And our last example, Luke chapter 13, verse 15 and 16. Here it is. The Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite. Who was he talking to? The Pharisees who had an issue with Jesus delivering a woman that was bound by Satan for 18 years. He freed her on the Sabbath. The, day, the Sabbath is the day of freedom. What does the church say? He freed her on the Sabbath and the Lord looked at these religious leaders and said to them, hypocrite, do not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead him away to water it? Verse 16, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. Jesus put it to them, think of it. Amen. Amen. He said, I'm tired of this. Think about it. Your ox has more right than this woman who's been bound by Satan 18 years. No, no, no. The Jews had 39 regulations of things you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Should I share all 39? One minute each? Absolutely not. <laughs> Y'all guys looked at me and no smiles came from any of you. It was, it was terrible. But here are they are. Here they are. I'm just going to tell you what they are. I'm not going to go through them one at a time. Is that okay, Joe? Give me okay, Joe. Oh, thank you, Joe. Joe agrees with me. Here are the 39 regulations that you could not do on the Sabbath. Carrying, burning, extinguishing, Finishing a work, writing, erasing, cooking, washing, sewing, tearing, knotting, untying, tying, shaping, plowing, planting, reaping, harvesting, threshing, winnowing, selecting, unselecting, sifting, grinding, kneading, combing, spinning, dyeing, chain stitching, warping, unraveling, building, demolishing, trapping, shearing, slaughtering, skinning, tanning, smoothing, and marking. If you did any of those, you are a Sabbath breaker. That's why Christians say you guys are burdensome when you keep the Sabbath. And they even went so far as making it a certain distance, Acts 1, verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from a mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. The Jews said, you can only go about a half a mile on the Sabbath before you violate it. Some of you will never be at church if that was God's requirement. <laughs> right, Jason? That's why they build their, they walk, they have their little communities and the synagogue is less than a half a mile away from the house. Anybody that's outside of that half a mile radius has to move to another area where the synagogue is within a half a mile. They don't press elevator buttons. They don't turn their lights on. They hire Gentiles to do that. You go to hell. We're not going to go to hell. That's what they said. No, I'm serious. We're in New York City. They have a Sabbath elevator. It stops at every floor. Have you seen that? That's why Christians think of us that way. And what did Jesus say about this distortion of the Sabbath? Here's what he says. Matthew 23, 4. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Never let the Sabbath be seen as a burden. Can the church say amen? amen? Here's the words of Jesus. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not what? Burdensome. 1 John 5 and verse 3. And why are they not burdensome? The Sabbath is not a burden. The Sabbath is not a burden. How do I know? I told you I was going to bring this one up. How do I know what does God call the Sabbath? Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. I'd like to invite the praise team to come up. Come and join me. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, God identifies the Sabbath as his, and call the Sabbath a burden, 
A what, friends? A delight. The holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him. Watch it today at Fellowship Lunch. Not doing your own way, nor finding your own pleasures. Watch this. Nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How would your spouse feel if at your, while you're celebrating your anniversary, you're talking about your friends? They'll say, whose day is this? Who's, whose day is this? What, what are we celebrating? Why do you keep talking about your friends? Do you think the Lord feels the same way? It's his holy day. Why are you talking about the world, the politics? You're talking about the new thing you just bought or the things in your community. Leave that for the unholy hours. God wants your heart and mind. And so I like this. Rem remember this? Remember this, friends? How many remember that? Old folk remember that, right? Young folk, hang out for a moment. What would Jesus do? This became a slogan that everybody had on their caps, their T-shirts. Remember that? What would Jesus do? Let's answer the question. Luke 4, 16, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, what would Jesus do? Jesus would keep the Sabbath. Come on, say amen. You can't be lost if you do what Jesus did. I guarantee it. If you want to be saved, just use Christ as your example, and you will not be left out of the kingdom. Now, I told you earlier that the Sabbath was hidden in Exodus 5, 5. It was hidden one more place in Hebrews 4, verse 9 and 10. Let's look at the amplified version. I love this. Does the Sabbath still exist? The Amplified Bible. And by the way, the compilers of the Amplified Bible wanted this version to be as close to the Greek as it possibly could be. Listen to what it says. So then there is still awaiting a full and complete Sabbath rest reserved for the true people of God. For he who has once entered God's rest also sees from the weariness and pain of human labors just as God rested from those labors peculiarly his own. There was a little typo there. God rested, we should rest. So here's my closing question. Not what did Jesus do? What is the question? What would you do? How many of you want to say by life and limb you want to keep God's Sabbath and be an example of how, watch your conversation. Watch what you do on the Sabbath. Not to be rigorous like the Jews, but remember the blessing of the Sabbath is right here. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. I'm not sure I understand. How many of you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life? Would you stand with me? Not what would Jesus do, but what will you do? Jesus, the Sabbath, and the Jews. What's my point? The Sabbath is not a Jewish institution. It's God's memorial of creation. The Sabbath is not a day of bondage. It's a day of freedom. It is not a burden. It's a delight. It is not a day to reject, but a day to embrace. Jesus did not violate the Sabbath. The Jews did. And remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy is not a suggestion. It's a command. Finally, don't ignore the day Jesus created, blessed, sanctified, rested on, and kept in favor of a day man substituted and prefers over obedience to God. Can you sing our song for us? This is what we want to do today. Don't forget the Sabbath. Don't forget the Sabbath. before. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed. That's right, once again. Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed. Sabbath day. 
When you walk outside, breathe some holy air. Not holy water. God bless that air today. God bless that sun to shine today. But God wants that sun to shine from your life. How do you honor the Sabbath? Do you slide into it? Are you still in the grocery store? Honor the Sabbath as you would honor all the other nine commandments and make Jesus Christ the reason. Not a regulation, not a law of rigorous exactions, but the freedom and liberty that we can only find. In the examples of Jesus, let your life be that place where Christ's presence and the beauty of the Sabbath is seen. You know, friends, we're going to keep the Sabbath throughout eternity. You know that? Why not do it now? Not the Jews, but how Jesus did it. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, yes, you said remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And as, as I communicate that today, there are so many clergy that are gearing up to post arguments against the thing you blessed, doing the devil's work. You honored it. Lord Jesus, you kept it. You blessed it. You sanctified it. You made it holy. You set it aside. And here we are in a world where people are chronicling their seven-day week, failing to realize that that seven-day week is including a capstone of the memorial of creation. But help us as Sabbath-keeping Christians to honor the Sabbath in a way that will bring glory and honor to you. This we ask in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said what? Amen and amen.